les plus abouties de l'engagement qu'on peut prendre vis-à-vis -vis des jeunes. Parce qu'il y a aussi une notion de réciprocité. Le jeune apporte quelque chose à la société. Et bien sûr, nous lui apportons cette opportunité d'effectuer une telle expérience. Qu'il s'agisse de la dimension de l'employabilité, ce que cette expérience, cet enrichissement à travers une activité non formelle apporte. Qu'il s'agisse de la citoyenneté, ou même de la solidarité, la confluence de tous ces objectifs dans le volontariat fait du volontariat certainement euh, un produit euh, essentiel que nous devons pouvoir offrir aux jeunes qui sont désireux d'y participer. As chairman of the IANIS Global Council, I want to welcome everybody here to the, the official opening of this conference on National Youth Service here tonight. Uh, we have 140 participants from 43 nations. This is the new INS. This is the sort of um, reincarnation of INS in a, in a new phase. And um, we're delighted. We're just absolutely delighted and a bit overwhelmed, I must say, to have um, sent out invitations to people and our various networks all over the world and to have people here from at this conference from 43 different countries is, um, is pretty remarkable, I think. What about Algeria? Argentina? Bosnia-Herzegovina? Bravo! Brunei? Burkina Faso, bravo. <laughs> Cambodia, <laughs> China, well, National Youth Service is a, is a relatively new idea, and it's definitely a very complex and multi-dimensional idea. In different countries, it gets little different uh, forms and shapes. Uh, in different, uh, in some countries, you may even find several uh, schemes of, uh, of national youth service or volunteers and so on. Yanis provides the uh, framework where all these diverse experiences and different uh, forms of uh, voluntary service can come together and be shared by members, uh, ideas can be changed, um, effectiveness can be compared and sometimes even evaluated in a better way. Kuwait. Sudan. UK, and Vietnam. We thank you all for coming.
because your contribution makes the conference an even richer experience, a learning opportunity that we wouldn't have had without you. Thinking to take the experience in the whole world, what kind of experience there is in different countries to my country in service, in youth services. In our country, volunteer means he doesn't take anything award for what he do. But there is a new concept now. I learned that volunteer should take something award. So in our country, volunteer doesn't take enough, no salary, no. It's a part-time job. He have his job and he volunteer after noon or another time. I came hoping to meet with persons from different continents to get a better sense of what was happening in the youth, National Youth Service in different places and to see if I could leave with a sense of some best practices that might be brought back to the National Youth Service in Jamaica. How different NGOs or associations could build up a civic service in their countries, uh, how to deal with the governments, how to come up with arguments, uh, how to deal with the private sector, uh, fundraising, uh, these different conferences uh, talk about uh, different subjects I will have to deal with in the next months with our association, so uh, it's a, for me it's a great preparatory work to, the, to what's next for us and uh, I hope it's going to help in Belgium and I hope next time to the next conference I can come and speak about the National Youth Service in Belgium. Uh, the opportunity I've had over my lifetime to be engaged in this field to, to hear the discussions that are going on in the workshops and the open sessions and general sessions are really profound when you start to try to get a conscious understanding of the global atmosphere of National Youth Service. Uh, sometimes we get quite captured within our own countries, like the United States, of the movements that go on there and the, the versatility of movements, science, uh, the history of our own country not bearing a clear understanding of value added in other countries, cultures, uh, traditions that come from people all over the world. Our organization, like many here, was formed in response to the needs and the potential contributions of youth. Like many countries, we have a very large youth population. When we did our feasibility study in 2005, we found that 70% of our population was under age 30. So we, we focused on things that people told us from all different sectors of society about young people and the needs of communities. We found that the ideas of volunteering and citizenship were not well understood, nor volunteers are most interested in what happens after their service. A full 60% of them in our recent survey told us that they're working for either NGOs or international organizations. These are very sought after jobs in Cambodia. We're just starting to see a stronger private sector in our country. So looking for partners, for networking, uh, see possibilities for, uh, for our young people uh, that we uh, can send uh, young people to other countries to, to do uh, some volunteer work or maybe to organize on special themes uh, seminars. Uh, for example, we are organizing a lot of meetings about intercultural uh, learning or you can say uh, intercultural or interreligious dialogue. I think that's a very important thing for the future. Uh, so in our uh, policy we, we uh, we have a special uh, interest in, in, the, in the Middle East and the Far East and now we are also uh, discovering, you can say, uh, Africa with our volunteers. Uh, we, we sent a lot of more to Latin America but it's in, in, in Europe, but uh, I hope to meet some people from, from the Middle East, the Far East and Africa. I wanted to come to this conference in order to evaluate in, uh, the state of youth service policy in the, in, in the European Union and to be able to make some accurate comparisons to what's going on in Hungary um, 
In Hungary, we have a model program that's operational in about 120 towns and cities across the country with about 10 to 15,000 volunteers on a yearly basis. Uh, it's called DIA for Democratic Ushifushagar Alapitvan. It's always kind of good to know whether what you're doing out in a remote part of Hungary uh, is uh, consistent with what's going on in other parts of Europe and whether your program is particularly strong or particularly weak or uh, to figure out if there is an opportunity to learn from other people's activities and policies and models. So we're really keen to be able to share some of our successes, um, particularly I suppose thinking, um, especially around some of the conversations that have been had so far at the conference around funding for National Youth Service. Um, one of the models that we use is a match fund model, which has worked out incredibly well for us. It's every pound of investment that we get from the corporate sector, we can match it with a pound of investment from the public sector. Um, and that's been a really fantastic incentive and a really great, great way to kind of encourage um, companies and businesses to come on board and support youth volunteering. Um, but perhaps the most significant um, investment certainly in the last decade prior to the creation of B uh, was the Millennium Volunteer Programme. Some of you may be familiar with that programme. But essentially it gave uh, young people aged 16 to 25 the opportunity to undertake volunteering or community action projects um, in projects across England. Um, with the opportunity to work towards a certificate which would give them either 100 hour service rising to 200 hour service. Um, over 6,000 young people were consulted um, about their views on the future of youth volunteering. Um, third sector and public sectors were also involved and business were also consulted. As a result of the commission, uh, a report was produced which get outlined kind of 16 recommendations to improve youth volunteering and to um, create a more appealing um, national framework in which more young people could get involved in service. The key recommendation was to establish an independent youth-led charity that would implement the new framework. Um, the reason I think that the, the government accepted these recommendations and focused on the desire to create an independent charity was, was really based on feedback from young people which said that if, a, if it was a government-led program which was kind of telling them that they ought to get involved in service and that service was a good thing, that that might actually instinctively be a turn off for some young people who wouldn't necessarily want to do what the government thought they should be doing. So there was a view that really, if, if it was an independent charity, it could position itself to take more risks, to get alongside young people, to speak their language, to relate to them in a way that they understood. Um, I think also, as I've mentioned before, that the desire to engage the private sector was also very strong. So having a, a new charity set up to kind of attract funding was also considered to be a good solution. So, um, enabling a charity to kind of work directly with the corporate sector. So, um, that, that led to the creation of B, which is the organisation that I'm now working for. Um, and essentially, B was charged with creating a new national framework for youth volunteering. There were three specific aims to, to the framework, which were to create a step change in the quality, quantity and diversity of youth volunteering in England. Um, quality really related to uh, well-managed, um, well-resourced volunteering opportunities um, which had a positive impact both for the young volunteer but also for the community. Uh, quantity related to the idea of having a mixed economy of opportunities, so having lots of different opportunities and a wide range of them which were universally available to young people and accessible to them wherever they were in the country. And finally diversity, this was about trying to kind of create a wider um, network of volunteering opportunities that reflected young people's cares, passions and interests. So really focusing perhaps away from the sport, starting to think about new media, virtual volunteering, creative arts, dance, music, um, really starting to diversify the offer for young people so that there were different ways that they could share their skills and talents um, to make a difference. And uh, so we're going to take the RERB right here and we're getting off at Gare du Nord and then we're taking line two and we're getting off at Metro Couronne. But I'll be keeping this on, so you want to speak? Okay, just a minute. <laughs> it's difficult to see how you can really compel people to be helpful. But if we make the opportunities attractive enough, interesting enough, powerful enough, so that young people know the impact they're making and they can see it before their very eyes, then I think there's very few who will refuse. We just heard this afternoon about French young people who work with the Ombudsman for Children going out to where children are in schools and hospitals and helping them to understand their rights and what they can do if they're worried about people trampling on their rights. That's a, a very new and exciting approach.
organization of the Café Social, of organizing the visits of the museum, uh, organizing these uh, photo exhibits that you can see here. There's also uh, a cinema thing that you know, they, they have so that people can come and watch movies, because the movies in Paris are very expensive, it's almost 10 euros to go to the movies. Uh, Monsef Labidi, uh, c'est le directeur qui va, qui va vous accueillir aujourd'hui. Donc, Monsef est le fondateur et le directeur de la structure de Mousseau et de Walter Mignon ici aujourd'hui. Donc, il a pris deux ans avant qu'il ouvre le café social pour vraiment prendre le temps de parler avec les migrants de l'âge et de voir vraiment ce qu'ils ont leurs problèmes et ce qu'ils ont leurs besoins. Il a fait beaucoup d'études et de recherche sur ce sujet avant d'ouvrir le Café Social. Le Café Social est l'une des réponses possibles pour aider avec les problèmes que sont les autres gens et faire en sorte que de plus en plus de se sortir et qu'ils n'ont pas de place pour aller. Ils ont été très difficiles dans des situations difficiles. Beaucoup d'entre eux sont très pauvres et donc ce endroit va être mieux. Mais ce lieu est une opportunité pour eux de se rencontrer. aux sans-abri, aux personnes qui sont, euh, soit, euh, qui sont dans une situation de précarité, soit ils ont un petit logement, soit ils sont avec euh, une petite ressource euh, de RMI, parce qu'en France on a le RMI, un revenu minimum d'insertion, euh, soit euh, les personnes ont une petite retraite, soit ils n'ont rien du tout, euh, ils n'ont pas de, de, de travail, ils n'ont rien du tout, et euh, surtout le problème c'est qu'ils n'ont aussi pas de papier. So the first action of this association is to prepare and distribute food to people who have no, either they have no home, they are homeless people, or they have a very low income. But people who, who are here um, illegally cannot have that income, so they don't have anything, and they're just working like in illegal things and they can have food here too so that's important because that's, there are not so many structures um, who can welcome uh, people who don't have any papers, who don't have identity, ID card. Like 40% of the people, uh, of volunteer people here are homeless people or people, uh, illegal people. The, the people coming from Afghanistan have 20 years old. And, uh, vous avez beaucoup de retraités aussi ou pas Et on a beaucoup, on a euh, 20% de retraités. And 20% of the people are uh, retired because we've got a, a huge problem with old people in France that have low income, so um, come being, becoming poorest. And what we can say is that it has a very important um, impact on the what the young people are allowed to do or uh, invited to do because I see not too many uh, programs where the volunteers came free. I remember going to a hospital in a nation I will not mention where we were encouraging the hospital to think about involving volunteers and I asked how many they would like and the hospital director said six. So I waited for my colleague to respond, and uh, before she did, he said, all right, then 12, which told us immediately, he had no idea what they were going to do. They came free, thanks to government money, and he wanted to please the government. And the, the, the nature of their role uh, hadn't been developed, and indeed could be entirely negative. And there are, unfortunately, some organizations that it's a question of numbers. Uh, more people, more participants that I have, more services I can do to the community, and it's not a question of budget. Uh, we hate this kind of model because it's a it's a way to produce all the problems for the nature, for the message to the young people above all. Our model is, okay, if you decide to send a project, why you decide to send the project? 
And then we have a, a rule. For each project, the maximum number is uh, six participants. And you need, as organization, to decide the objectives having this kind of limit. It is a kind of self-learning for the organization too, to think uh, which kind of goal is possible to realize having this maximum number of. And one of the reasons is because uh, this small number is a way to create a group and to learn operators and young people to work together to have specific objectives. Just a quick on the Jamaican experience. The, we have three approaches. One where the private sector would pay the stipend for the participants that go to their um, placement. The second, we have a situation where government and NGOs would give lunch assistance. So the NYS would pay the stipend, but lunch assistance would be given by government and NGO. The third is a situation where the placement is asked to get into a mentoring relationship with the participants. So there is no money involved, but the participants become a mentor to that particular corporate entity to which they are placed. Before any participant is placed anywhere, a job description has to be agreed and written. So the participant on the first day of placement will be given a written job description indicating that over the period of placement, these are what your functions are going to be. This is the duration for which you're gonna be working here, and this is when you start a day and complete a day. So we try to use that to build a real culture of productivity in the, particip in the participant, as well as a culture of responsibility on the side of the, uh, the placement. A few basic facts about uh, the civic service in Israel now. We have approximately 12,000 volunteers in service now. Um, last year with 11,000. Their ages are 18 to 22. Majority of the volunteers are yet uh, are females, um, due to the fact that most of Israeli males are serving in the army. And the eight uh, percent of the volunteers are Israeli Arabians. I think that in the context of a global financial crisis, um, things are going to get a lot harder for young people and in the context of developing countries unemployment among youth is going to increase and so the pressure on countries to find solutions for young people's development and how they can be mainstreamed will increase to an even greater extent than we've been experiencing them. So I think IANIS increasingly will have a bigger role to play in helping to shape the policy agendas around National Youth Service and to help set new benchmarks in terms of what constitutes um, productive and ex experiential and developmental youth service programs. I think we need to guard against what could be a tendency to use youth service to control young people and close them down because governments have no other options. So I think IANIS can play quite a big role as setting the quality standards for youth service internationally. You see, governments usually do not like to deal with issues like volunteerism. It's almost like a, a, an antagonism. Governments and voluntary actions don't go together. Governments usually talk about policies, budgets, programs, and, and so on. And especially when, when a, a voluntary scheme requires some extra budget from the government, then they are even more strongly objecting to it, and they are they're not happy about it. That was the case in Israel for, for a long time, and still is. My greatest uh, fights not with 
Arab leaders, Israeli Arab leaders who check the program, nor with the ultra orthodox rabbis who check the program. My greatest fights are with the Treasury uh, the officials and clerks in the, in the Treasury Minister. They, they object uh, budgets that have to go to programs that are voluntary, that have to do with the community, and have to do with uh, voluntarism. It's something <coughs> that cannot be too developed. And I think it's only when these two uh, players, those two roles, uh, uh, come together, join together, that it can work. The, the social, the NGO sector, that comes up with the initiatives and the ideas and so on. And people within the government who understand that in the long run, such programs can help in terms of the labor market, uh, employability, uh, contributing to the uh, national budget and things like that. Only when you can bring those two bodies together to think along the same lines, that you can overcome and one of the reasons I think it's that the, the it's complicated to combine the long-term strategy as an educational strategy that this kind of program because we need time to offer to the society, the local communities, the real results, not only in terms of facts, but in terms of people that before wasn't able to serve the community and after are able to serve the community. And the short-term strategies of politicians, they have uh, four years, so in Italy it's difficult for you, maybe two years. So we have uh, some troubles in government and we need to change something. So this is one challenge. How is possible to combine these two different strategies, long-term and short-term? To ask the question, which most folks are still asking today, why would I, as a corporate company or a philanthropy or a state or federal government, deploy resource into a national service instrument of any type, volunteerism included, uh, what would I get back for my money in return? I think that's a difficult question to answer today. And because the variables are so different throughout different countries of how, how you'd actually qualify the response to that. But what we're missing is, what is it that we're really trying to do? We're trying to get societies back together in a civil sense of engagement where, where families are talking to each other, where young people are becoming viable within their own communities, where, where national youth service in any country becomes something of an, an opportunity, a visual opportunity for the country as well as the young people to actually be invested in something, a meaningful uh, experience and opportunity. And, and to bring not just credibility back to themselves for why they engage, but to their whole family for being someone in a community that's engaging in service and helping and having compassion on other folks. But uh, it's not about numbers. Uh, it's really about personal transformation of young people and the contributions they're making. And um, it's just, I mean, it's not enough just to have those quantitative, the quantitative data there you know, the number of young people. It's like, what have they done and how has it impacted them and how do you measure that and how do you evaluate that? Because that's finally what's, what's going to make the difference. It's not, it's not about 250,000, yeah, it's a great number, but more than that, how has it really made a difference? We created a new agency of the, of the federal government. So uh, a new department, as it were, of the government was created to administer the AmeriCorps program, as well as two other programs. Um, a program that engages older people in service called the Senior Corps, which has about 500,000 uh, people participating every year. And another program called Learn and Serve America, which is uh, directs government money at schools, universities, and community organizations to engage younger citizens in service learning activities. Maybe that's where Giannis could be uh, uniquely positioned to keep things going and progress growing and finding 
getting the policymakers into the room with the donors, into the room with the practitioners from the NGOs. The chance to talk to, especially informally, to talk to other persons outside of the, the formal setting has been, I think, very important for me. And to hear a person's inputs as to, you know, their personal experiences is, is critical. Because in this type of conference, everybody, you know, everyone doesn't have a chance to actually talk about their particular concerns, issues, challenges, etc. Because it's, you know, it's, it's not on for that not length of time. So to have that informal setting where you can talk to others, I, that, that is um, an experience I would just take, take back with me. Um, and then again, to just, just see, be hearing from other persons in the, in the formal setting has been, has, has been very, um, has been very positive. Well, I think INS uh, can play an important role um, it, with, in many different ways. Um, there's no uh, association of people working in the field of national youth service around the world. So in a way, we're filling a need and a gap that's there. It's not as though we're competing with other organizations that already exist. So that's, it's a niche that, uh, that INS is filling that I think the response to this conference um, demonstrates that there's a real need for an association that brings people together who are working in very different contexts around the world but nevertheless share some common interest in creating high quality programs, for advocating with government for support, for um, doing research and evaluation um, of, of their programs, of really um, providing opportunities for young people to make a difference in their communities. And I want to say to you that this world would be a bleaker place, this world would be a more pessimistic place if it were not for people and organizations like the ones that you represent. Organizations that say to the world that we are not prepared to accept that the world we live in is the best that humanity can create for itself. We refuse to accept that it is okay for so many millions of people live without water, live without sanitation, live without housing, live without health care. And these <coughs> people, when you add them all up, are not a small statistical minority. When you add up women, men, uh, sorry, young people who are marginalized, older people who are marginalized, people living with disability, people who have alternative sexual orientations and so on. When you add up all these groups of so-called socially excluded people, Sadly, collectively, they're not a minority. They are either a majority or they are a very substantial minority. So 